Inside, it's comfortable. Inside a house, inside a family, inside a routine. But what if we widen our view beyond the fence across the street? Outside, we find people struggling with loneliness, poverty, families that don't look like ours, or without a safe family at all. Jesus didn't call us to live by our neighbors. He called us to love our neighbors. Well, good morning. Hey, Pathways. How are we doing? Are you guys uh, enjoying your summer? Uh, kids are going to be going back to school pretty soon, so I hope all of you are spending some additional family time and making the most before uh, summer ends. How many of you went to the Packer uh, family night uh, last week and maybe did some of that? You're hanging out and uh, eating additional ice cream because it's so hot outside or whatever you're doing. I hope you're enjoying your summer. You know, for me and my family yesterday, we actually went to Burger Fest. We went to the Burger and Balloon Festival in Seymour, Wisconsin, the uh, home of the... That's right. And so I have some pictures of different hot air balloons that went up that we were a part of, and we got to see uh, some really cool shots of, of hot air balloons that took off about 6 o'clock in the evening. And uh, we didn't stay for the glow uh, when, they, when they come back and, and kind of light them up, but it was absolutely beautiful. And there's something, though, that prior to seeing this, there's something that's called the ketchup slide. No, seriously, it's called the ketchup slide. I even took a picture of it, and we were there, and we were hanging out as a family, and I saw somebody from Pathways who actually was like a, a judge for the ketchup slide. Yeah, like he was like hardcore. He has a twin brother, his name is Steve, and the guy who comes to Pathways, his name is Dave. And so David, like they had like radios, and they were measuring, so it was like women and men, and they would run down this like massive... Here, take a look. Here's, here's what Dave did from our, our church. He actually was a participant. That's ketchup right there. That's all ketchup. That's called the ketchup slide. Okay, that's the ketchup slide. All right, so uh, pretty awesome. And um, I actually, uh, Laura signed up and did that later on. No, I'm just joking. Uh, been awesome if she would have done that. That's ketchup slide, and uh, we had a wonderful time, and I hope that you're enjoying your summer. Hey, listen, we're in week two of a series called How to Neighbor, and if you missed last weekend or uh, if you are going to miss in the next two weeks, I want to tell you a couple ways that you can uh, stay up with us. First way is really simple. You can log on to our website at pathwayschurch.us, and as long as you pay your internet bill, you can check out some messages there. Or probably the easiest way is to download our mobile app. Check out our mobile app, download that. It's a great way if you're on lunch break or if your kids go down for a nap, you can listen to this message or you can share messages with your friends and neighbors around this idea of how to neighbor. We archived, you can listen at your convenience. Now, the best way though, and this is huge, especially if you're our guest today. If you're our guest today, we're so glad that you're with us at Pathways. If you're on the fence of faith or you're just exploring, this is a place designed for you. We want to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so there, there, there's one way, the best way that I got to tell you about how you can track and grow with us. Now, if you're a veteran, you've been here at Pathways for like two years, I'm going to need your help to explain to our guests the three environments here at Pathways Church, okay? So in this next moment, I need you to help me. This is audience participation. I need you to help me explain to our guests, those who are new to Pathways, some of our environments. All right, so what's our first environment? By the way, hint, you're sitting in one of the environments right now. What's our first environment? It's called the... Oh, yes, that's like music to my ears. And the second environment is called? And the third environment is called? Yeah, row, circle, chair. And so if you are new to Pathways, if you're a guest, the best way for you to track and to be a part and grow is through the circle. Because we believe, I believe, that circles are better than rows because in a circle you're face to face. And what we do in circles, we meet other Christian brothers and sisters and we grow together. Like we grow together, you can use the talk on any given weekend from this platform. We design questions where you can search scripture and study and connect and grow together. Or you can use something that we call Right Now Media. It's a free resource where you can uh, use some uh, Bible studies and gather together and you're going to grow in your faith. You're going to enjoy one another. You're going to learn to do life together. And rows are so much, uh, they're, they're not really designed for that. The row is not designed, but circles are. Now, um, quick question. 
Uh, how many of you, uh, can I see your hand, if you're a part of a circle, circle, whether you're a leader or you're just in a circle as a participant, I don't care if you're in student ministry, kids ministry, if you lead one, can I just see your hands? Yeah, 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 look around, look around. We have 41 small groups at Pathways Church, over 400 people in circles. That's something to celebrate because we're growing deeper with one another and with God. So, so circles are the way, are, are the way for, for us, the best way really to lead you in this growing relationship with Jesus. Now, we need more circles because we need more people who are part of community. They're growing just beyond the row. They actually want to grow their faith closer together with other friends and believers. And so uh, we're going to be doing something uh, in September, and it's called Group Link. Group Link is going to be an amazing opportunity for uh, some of you who are not a part of a small group. I want you to come out and meet some small group leaders and get engaged in a small group. Now, if you raised your hand and you're already a part of a small group or you lead a small group, here's what I need from you. Five minutes after service today, I just want to share with you something so, so important. So if you're a part of a small group, you're in a small group, you lead a small group, if you could just hang here for five minutes after today's message, that would be fantastic. All right, so by way of review, if you were here last weekend or missed last weekend, I just want to share with you on this series, How to Neighbor, the big idea, the bottom line is simply this, that Jesus didn't call us to live by our neighbors. He called us to love our neighbors. Jesus called us to love our neighbors. Love is so important in our world today. Love changes people. Love is what gets beyond people's misconceptions and their hurts and their wounds. Genuine and true love that flows from the Father's heart, from God the Father, through your life to another individual in any capacity, in any way, shape, or form, is what changes people. Love is what can change the world. Love that is perfect is what casts out all fear. Love is what brings wholeness and healing. Love is what notices people. Love lifts the spirit. Love creates imagination. Love is what injects hope and infuses purpose. Love is what lights up a person's eyes. You remember when you were a kid, for most of us, we experienced this kind of love when we just had this extravagant, adorable kind of love. We would look at our parents and we would just love them. Like, we didn't know their faults. We didn't see some of their inconsistencies when we were little. We just had this pure and innocent kind of love, right? For most of us, that was true. If you were like me, I mean, I just love mom and dad, which, by the way, they would probably be watching. I love you, mom. Love you, pat mom. Dad, knuckles. I mean, <laughs> that was just, we just loved. Love is what changes people. Is a part of the Christian faith. In fact, if you remember from last week, there was this exchange, this, this significant conversation between a lawyer, an expert in the law, and he said, you know, Jesus, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know what? How about you answer the question since you're an expert? And he said, well, that's, here's how I would reduce everything down in the Old Testament. That, that it's simply this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor there's our word, as yourself. And Jesus said, yeah, right on, knuckles. You got it. He said, you got it. That's it. That's what it comes down to. But the problem is this. The problem is that it's more convenient to let it be about me than it is about you. And it's more convenient for you to let it be about you than it is me. And it's more convenient for us to let it be about us than about our neighbors, right? Because when you engage with people, if you truly love them, love is messy and love is hard and people are messy and people are hard. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, say amen after this but you're hard and messy too, Amen. right? But this is the kind of life that Jesus invites us to be a part of, to 
to love others the way that we love him. In fact, if you're new or if you're returning here at Pathways, that's why the environment of the chair is so critical because every morning when you wake up or, or several times throughout your week, this isn't a legalistic thing. It's an invitational thing to get in touch with the Father to say, Father, I love you so much. Help me to love my neighbor today. Because I don't know about you, but me, when I miss or skip on the chair, it's a lot harder for me to love because I can't love without the power and the grace and the truth and the wisdom of God flowing through me. It is an unnatural thing to love people because I am selfish and I'm prideful and I don't want to because <laughs> it's more convenient to let it be about me than it is to be about you or to be about my neighbor. Now, in this uh, exchange, there's a question. Once um, uh, Jesus says, you know, you're right. What, you're right. You hit it right on the head. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here is what the lawyer, the expert in the law, this Jewish man says to Jesus. In verse 29 of Luke chapter 10, he says, but he wanted to say that word with me, justify. Oh, man, aren't you a good justifier, a justificationer? Er, er, er. I don't know if that's a word. I'm just making it up. But don't, we justify, don't we? Like, yeah, I don't really need to love. You know, like, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. You know, I'll schedule you. You're not, I, you know, whatever. Like we, and, and he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, he's an expert in the law, a lawyer, and so he's wonderful at debating. And what he's doing to Jesus, he's saying, how about you define your own terms? How about you define what a neighbor really looks like? Now, today, in the next couple moments, I want to talk to you. I want to give a message that talks about this idea of neighboring. How to neighbor people when they don't look like us. When they don't look like us. How, how do we neighbor people when they don't look like us. Because Jesus is going to respond to this lawyer's question. And he's going to do it in a really cool way. But to understand how to neighbor people who don't look like us, we have to understand, first understand this term bias. Bias. Now we all have biases. A bias is showing favor against or for something. It could be an object, it could be a person, it could be a group of people. We all have biases, all of us. In fact, uh, these biases are innate. We're born with biases. I read an interesting study on a uh, lab. It was called, uh, it's called the Infant Cognition Laboratory. It's known as the baby lab. It's on the campus of Yale University. And there's this doctor who's known as the baby whisperer. Isn't that cool? Baby whisperer. And what they're doing, they're doing clinical testing into understanding if babies have biases. And so there was this interesting study that they did with, with babies uh, ages uh, six to nine months. And what they did was simply this. They took a baby and they put two little dishes in front of the baby, one filled with Cheerios and the other filled with Golden Grahams, okay? And they put those before the baby and they allowed the baby to choose either a Cheerio or a Golden Graham, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put before you imaginary Cheerios and imaginary Golden Grahams, and I want you to pick which one you would want, okay? Ready? So here are the Cheerios, reach for the Cheerios. Go ahead, you could just reach your hand. Who would want the Cheerios? Yeah, nobody wants Cheerios. Who wants the golden grams? Oh, the golden honey. Yes, right there. Yes, all right. He did this with babies. Now, once the baby picked their cereal of choice, their snack of choice, what they did was <clears throat> they took out two teddy bears behind a black curtain, you know, put and they had one teddy bear pick the Cheerios and one teddy bear pick the Golden Grahams. Then they removed the Cheerios and the Golden Grahams and they just brought out two teddy bears. Guess which one the baby chose? The one that chose the cereal they liked. Why? Because they had a bias. Even at seven months, they wanted to be with people who were like 
them. They, they, they had certain innate bent or proclivities toward the teddy bear that liked their cereal. Isn't it true for us? That we really enjoy people who think like us, who vote like us, who look like us, who are educated like us, who live where we live and talk like we talk. We all have biases. And some social researchers and psychologists would even call these biases, they're so innate, they're called implicit biases. They're so subtle and subconscious and subterranean within the soul and the spirit of humanity that we don't even know that we're being biased. If you can't admit that you have biases, something is deeply, deeply wrong because we all have them. And if we're not careful, our biases can lead us to prejudge people. And we all prejudge people. I mean, let's be honest. Have you ever gotten on an airplane and went through TSA and you saw a certain person from another culture and you thought to yourself, I'm a little nervous right now. We prejudge people. Have you ever prejudged a person and you thought, oh, you know, rich people are snobs or overweight people are lazy or you know what, an older generation, we can't learn anything from an older generation or if you're part of an older generation, you say, you know what, the younger generation, they barely work. They just like to sip chai lattes at Starbucks and do nothing, right? We all have these predetermined judgments of people or based on a color of skin or maybe a gender. How could a woman do a, as good a job at a, as a male in this industry? There's absolutely no way. And then we create systematic structures that oppress people. Or we have judgments we would say, or oh, you know what? White men can't jump. <laughs> That's actually true. That was my vertical leap right there. And no, I'm just, just joking. I was trying to bring some humor because this message is kind of hard. Sometimes as believers, and if you're not a believer, this is a fantastic weekend for you to be here because sometimes as Christ followers, we miss the fact that we're sinful still and that we miss it still. And we have some stuff that God needs to speak to us and to deal with. So, how do you neighbor someone when they look different than you? In fact, who is your neighbor? Well, Jesus answers that question with one of the most famous stories, parables of the scripture. He doesn't go back to the lawyer and speak in some abstract or technical language. He tells a story. It's a story of the Good Samaritan. Let me work with you through it. In verse 30, it says this. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, let me pause there for a second. That road was a dangerous road. That trek from Jerusalem to Jericho was actually 17 miles. And then during those 17 miles, there's a very windy and steep descent over 3,000 feet you would descend as a traveler. And so there's this man, he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And scripture says when he was attacked by robbers, because robbers would like to kind of hang and they would, at the different bends, they would just collude there and then they would go jump somebody. Attacked by robbers. The Bible says not only was he attacked, but he was like beaten and stripped of his clothes. And, and the Bible says that he was actually just left there half dead. Now, have you ever been on the playground and somebody gets busted in the mouth and they said, give me your lunch money? Have you ever seen that happen? Okay, if you've seen that happen, or pushed down, right? We're in little kids on the playground. Usually the kid would get up and they would go cry and they would run to the teacher or the principal and, you know, the situation would get fixed and resolved. That's not what we're talking about. In the day and the age that we live in, we can go on YouTube or we can, we can stream something and we, we can see some of the most grotesque and violent acts. This is what that would be compared to. Somebody just pummeling and pounding and stripping and laid there half dead. Now, a priest, there's a couple people in this story. A priest 
happened to be going down the same road. Now, the priest, you can read about priests, and the second guy is a Levite. You can read about priests and Levites in Numbers chapter 18. In Numbers 18, it describes what a priest is. A priest was responsible for tabernacle or temple worship. It was their job to make sure all the sacrifices and offerings were acceptable unto God. They were like the main dudes in charge. So when Jesus was telling this lawyer who was Jewish about the priest, the lawyer was like, oh, let's see what the priest does. Well, here's what the priest does. The priest happened to be going down the same road, 17 miles, 3,000 feet in descent. And when he saw the man who was stripped, beaten, and there, half dead, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. Passed by on the other side. Here's the second individual. Verse 32, so to a Levite who would assist. Now here's what Levites did. They assisted the priest either in the temple or the tabernacle. They would assist in, in, in the religious and the sacrificial duties. So the priest would say, hey, I need some help. Can you go get another bull or can you get this or can you clean this up? This is what a Levite would do, a very religious person who understood the laws and the ways of God. These were the people who were telling people how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. They were teaching little kids and adults about this idea of, of, of what it means to hear, O Israel, that the Lord your God, the Lord Lord is one. They were teaching the commandments. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he, what did he do? He passed by on the other side too as well. Now notice both individuals, both the priest and the Levite, they saw the person who was in need. They saw the individual. But they made a decision to pass on the other side. Let's read on. A Samaritan, though, as he traveled, came where the man was. Notice what he did. When he saw him, just like the priest and the Levite, they, all three of them saw them. Let me pause there for a second. Just because you see a person in need doesn't mean you're neighboring them well. Every one of us sees needs every single day. It's not if we notice them. It's what we do about the need that we see. And this is what the Samaritan, notice what he did. He took pity on him. Do you know what that's reflected of? That's reflected of the Samaritan's heart. His heart ached and hurt for the person in need. It was an emotive response. It was like, you know what, this person is hurting. I see their need. I want to help them. As Christians, our heart should hurt for hurting people. If your heart doesn't hurt for hurting people, something's wrong with your heart. If you're in touch with the heart of God, if you love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you see someone hurting, and your heart at some level does not hurt, friends, we have to turn to God and ask God to grow our heart because our heart should hurt for people. What does he do, the Samaritan, not only does his heart, not only does he notice, not only does his heart hurt, but he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. It was for medicinal purposes. It was like he was giving him Tylenol and, and, and he, was, he was taking and he was saying, you know what, here's a concoction. It would be like Ben Gay or Deep Blue or whatever you would use or doTERRA oils. He like spread it all over the guy, okay? Then he put the man on his own donkey, which meant that what? He was walking the rest of the way from Jerusalem to Jericho. He gave up his own car keys and said, I'll drive you to where? He brought him to an inn and took care of him. He could have brought him to a cave. He could have took him to his mother-in-law's house. <laughs> that would have been awesome if that was the story, but it wasn't. But he took him to an inn, which meant what? Meant that he was going to have to pay some money. Who's going to flip the bill? Because this guy was beaten, stripped, and half dead. Think when the innkeeper saw this guy, he's like, oh, man. <laughs> Woo! It's going to be like the Ritz-Carlton. We can upcharge this guy to death. No, that guy looked like death. He's thinking, who's going to pay the bill? You know who paid the bill? Samaritan. Now, if 
If you're the lawyer, the expert in law, and you're Jewish, and you're listening to this rabbi, this Jesus person, tell this story, inside there is so much tension and disequilibrium. You're like, ugh. Let me, let me, let me tell you. It would be like, It'd be like, so there was this guy who was busted up, and he got, he got mugged, and you know what? A pastor came by, and you're a Christian, you're like, yeah, what's pastor going to do? What's pastor going to do? Pastor falls off, doesn't do well. Okay, well, there's this guy who's mugged and busted up, and then there's like this awesome lay leader. What's a lay leader going to do? He's a Christian. He's so devoted. What's he going to do? He messes up. Then there's this dude who's like, you don't like that person. In fact, they don't look like you. In fact, you actually harbor some bitterness and anger and hatred toward that person. The expert in the law would have heard the term Samaritan, and this is what he would have wanted to do. <coughs> like, really? A Samaritan? I'm going to puke my guts out. Why? Because Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. Why? Because they were a mixed descent, part Jewish, part foreign descent of another nation. They weren't totally Jews, and they weren't totally un-Jews. They were just, they hated each other, not only for ethnic reasons, but also for religious reasons. Because Samaritans would use one version of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, a similar version, but they didn't worship at the temple. They worshiped at a mountain. Mount Gerizim, to be exact. And so there was a lot of hatred that went hundreds of years before Jesus' time, like six or 700 years. There was a lot of ethnic discrimination against Samaritans. In fact, it was a version of racism. And racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. And racism, friends, exists in our world today, right here in our nation in ways that hurts the heart of God. Do you know that today is the one-year anniversary of what happened at Charlottesville, Virginia this past, last year, today? August 12th, 2017, three people were killed as white nationalists were messaging a voice, a voice of hatred to law enforcement officials, a 32-year-old woman, Heather High. Heather Heyer was a counter-protester, and she was killed as a car was backed up. There was something that was so tragic, all based on race, a message of hatred. Do you know what will be happening today? Be a rally in our nation's capital of some of the same messages of hatred toward people of another race. We live in a world today that is so broken and confused about race. We have movements like Black Lives Matter. We have factions and differences and things that want to choose to separate and divide us. And as Christians, I want you to hear today that God loves all people, that there's only one race and it's the human race, that God throughout the Bible is always trying to to, to tear down walls that want to separate and divide, and he wants to raise up a people who love his son, Jesus. If you don't believe it, you should read the story of Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 between Jew and Gentile. You should look over your Old Testament because in the Old Testament, God was lifting up the Israelite nation, not to say, hey, they are so great, but because they would live under his provision and protection, all nations would come. The prophet Isaiah says all nations would come and worship at the river of God because God's blessing and favor was on this group of people. And then in the New Testament, he takes his Holy Spirit Spirit, and he injects his spirit into the hearts of those who follow Jesus. And he says, I want you to live differently. I want you to love people in a way that will blow their minds when it comes to race and gender and everything that chooses to divide us culturally, anything, ageism, sexism, all of it. I want you to be different. I want you to be followers of the way. I want you to be like Jesus. I want you to love.
We did this first service, and I think it is only appropriate we do it this service. It should hurt our hearts that at our capital today, messages of hatred will be taking place. We need to pray. We need to pray that messages of love would take place at our capital. Messages of love would start in our homes and our neighborhoods right here in northeast Wisconsin. That Christians, every single Christian who calls themselves a Christ follower would begin to confront their own biases and their prejudgment. And if there are any racist attitudes, we need to repent and we need to renounce and we need to ask God to heal our hearts. Because when he heals our hearts as his kids, as his children, we can help heal the hearts of others who are broken and wounded through the power of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. It's what he calls us to be about. So would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father, we lift up our nation today as there would be messages of hatred. God, I pray for a message of love, a message of unity, a message of hope. God, that you would raise your church, your true followers, to love in ways that would only be described in terms of who you are. Help us to be uniters and not dividers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is what Jesus says. Jesus says to the expert in the law, he gives him this verse and he says, so let me ask you, which of these three do you think was a neighbor, there's our word, to the man who fell into the hands of of the robber. Which one? Expert in the law is done puking. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I guess it's it's the individual who showed compassion and mercy. It was the Samaritan. This is what Jesus says. If you have U version or if you have a Bible, you should highlight this thing. Jesus says, go and do likewise. He doesn't say go and think about doing. He doesn't say go and pray about it. Go and fast on it. Go and learn another law or scripture about it. No, 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 no. Jesus says go and do. Take action. Be about it. Get after it. Do likewise. Do as you saw the person who you hated the most how they took the higher road and just define what a true neighbor is. You know what a neighbor is? A neighbor is somebody, a neighbor is anybody we meet in need. Uh, yesterday, let me tell you a little story. I was at Burger Fest, and we, had, we got some burgers together. So we had a cheeseburger and a hamburger, and family was sitting down, and we were eating together. And um, there was a bench. There was a bench like this end and this end of the bench. And... Um, there was a, a woman who I presumed to be the girlfriend or the wife of another man. They were probably in their 50s. And so she was seated there. And her husband or boyfriend, or maybe they were trying to spark up something. I don't know. But there was, some, there was a gap here, right? And he was seated. Okay? Here's what happened. She stood up. And what do you think happened? And he went down. Because it tipped the bench. <laughs> tipped the bench. So he fell down on his butt. Yeah, in front of a lot of people. Now I'm sitting here and I'm eating my cheeseburger and I take a bite and I see this happen. True or false, is he my neighbor? Yes. Yeah, why? Because he had a need. He had to get off his butt. <laughs> now, I, I, I wasn't supposed to pray for him. Dear God, help him get off his butt. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to fast and put my cheeseburger down so maybe he could get off his butt. I wasn't supposed to say, hey, Ezekiel 22, 18 says, thus saith the Lord, get off your butt so you don't look like a clown. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. I wasn't supposed to do that. Do you know what I was called to do? To walk over and help him up off of his butt. <laughs> don't know him. Could have made a lot of excuses. There was another guy who helped out. We helped him up. Dudes, you know, you'd have been totally embarrassed. He was embarrassed. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, I didn't get off, man. I'm fine. I'm like, it's okay. It's cool. He sat down. I just felt like God said, that was your neighbor, someone in need. We all have needs. We all see people in need. So the question for us this weekend is simply this. How do we neighbor those who are different from us? 
There's three practices that I want to give you by way of application. The first is this. The first is to slow down. Slow down and avoid judgment. Now, when you see that term, avoid judgment, you're like, you're, if you're a Christian, you're thinking, yeah, preach it, pastor. That's awesome. Let's not be judging. Let's not be judging. Listen, Jesus doesn't say that we shouldn't evaluate people. We need to evaluate people. Dads, when your teenage girl brings a boy home, are you evaluating? You're darn right you're evaluating. You're polishing your shotgun. You've got your big truck out that's a big Ford Raptor, and you're ready to, you're, you're like, woo, woo, woo. home by 1030, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush your skull on this deal, okay? Like, you're evaluating. God's word even says that we as Christians need to evaluate. We need to make sure the gospel is true to what the Bible teaches. We need to evaluate, uh, I think in the, uh, John says in uh, 1 John, test, try the spirits. We need to evaluate. But what Jesus is teaching is that we need to slow down and avoid a certain kind of judgment, a harsh or hypocritical form of judgment. See, when we evaluate and we get harsh, remember that little illustration I just told you, dads? Like when you're polishing shotguns and you're trying to intimidate and you're being harsh with the boy that she brings home, that's not good kind. That's called, that's like negative judgment. You're already drawing conclusions. You're harsh. Or maybe, and Christians are really good at this, oh, I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe they would. How could they ever do that? And yet that same sin resides in your own life. And yet you're hypocritical. That's why Jesus says, you know what? Be careful that you don't go and you don't try to pick out a speck of sawdust in someone else's eye when there's a log jammed in your own eye. In that same passage, that's what Jesus teaches about. He says in Matthew 7, 2, he says this when it comes to judgment. He said, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Do you know what Jesus is saying? If you're harsh and hypocritical in your judgment, that judgment is coming back on you, on me. So we need to slow down and we need to be very careful with our thoughts and our words about having harsh or hypocritical kinds of judgment. You don't know what it's like to walk in there. That's not a Bible verse, but it's a good piece of wisdom. Be careful. The second practice is this. Seek to understand before you're understood. Seek to understand before you're understood. When I was in college, I was given a book that we were all supposed to read. It was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. You ever read the book? It's one of his habits. Seek to understand before you're understood. Understand someone else's experience before you go spouting off at the mouth about your own experience or about your own filter, your own worldview that is so proper and correct and so right and is so true through you in the cockpit at headquarters, rather than just making all these assumptions, seek to understand another person's position. Before you start talking, before you start engaging, slow down and seek to understand. Ask questions. Ask, be curious. Do you know Christians are some of the most non-curious people I've ever met? You know why? Because we're so afraid. Like if we talk to somebody and they share something that's contrary to our belief system or our morals, all of a sudden we're like, we're all intimidating that our big balloon of theological doctrine and belief is going to get popped and go, and God's not going to be real and then we're not going to go to heaven and it's all a big lie and we're always scared. Seek to understand and be curious about people's position and their own experience. You know why? Because it'll strengthen your own belief, your own core. It'll help you to connect with people. I was at a restaurant recently, and uh, I walked up to the counter, and there was a guy in front of me, and uh, he purchased something. He got a receipt, and then uh, he was waiting for uh, his food to come. And I walked up, and I purchased something, and I got a receipt, and the person behind the register was like, hey, you know what, if you take uh, this survey, if you just take this survey and fill this out, then you'll, um, you have an opportunity to win something. Actually, you can bring that back. They'll send you something, you bring that back, and you get some more food. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then I was standing there, and I thought, I wonder if he got the same receipt that I got. Because nobody said anything about the survey to him. They told me about the survey. 
walked out the door, and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, um, did your receipt, he said, have a survey? I said, yeah. He said, they didn't tell you about the, no, they didn't tell me. He was a black guy who got a receipt. I was a white guy who got a receipt. We live right here in northeast Wisconsin. For weeks, I kept that receipt on my desk at work to remind me that our biases, our judgments, and our racist thoughts hurt people. I, I said to the gentleman, I said, I'm sorry. He said, thank you. Sometimes that's my experience. I said, I'm sorry for that. I said, thank you. Sometimes we need to slow down and we need to ask questions and we need to learn to empathize with people that we have drawn conclusions about their story and their experience that we know nothing about. Because you would like to be afforded the same opportunity when somebody judges you. So why wouldn't you love your neighbor as your, yourself? It's like biblical, isn't it? The last practice is simply this. Meet the need you see. If you grew up in church, you heard uh, the little thing that would say, uh, see a need, meet a need. I, I just put it this way. Meet the need you see. Why? Because I think a lot of people see needs. Very few people meet needs. <laughs> I want to be around need meters, not need seers. I'm tired of everybody seeing a lot of needs. I want to see a lot of people who meet a lot of needs. Because when I'm around people who meet needs, I want to be around them. You know why? Because great neighbors who meet needs are great disciples of Jesus Christ. They're actually doing what Jesus did. He met needs. He was always teaching. He was always healing. He was always loving. He was always taking people who were the furthest away from God and he was showing them extravagant grace and care and love. And for all the people who always thought they knew all the right answers and got it right, Jesus is like, you have absolutely zero idea because your pride and your self-righteousness and your indignation trips you up. I want to close this weekend with a song that I've been listening to continuously, a song that I believe is going to really speak to your heart around this idea of being a neighbor. This is such a powerful song, and as you sit and you think about this, I want the words to wash over you, and I want them to lift your spirit and give you an imagination of who you can become as a neighbor to the people that you meet who are in need. This song, I believe, is going to set us on a different direction, a different course as a church, as we learn how to neighbor.